Hey, what's up everybody? We are checking out The French Revolution Oversimplified Part 2, right after this. Alright, first things first, if you're one of my subscribers, welcome back. Love you guys. You're helping me build a really cool channel and I super appreciate that. I know it's a small handful so far, but it's a growing handful and it makes me more grateful than I can express that I see more subscribers showing up and joining the ride on this channel. So it's way cool guys and I really appreciate it. So The French Revolution Part 2 by Oversimplified. The first one was awesome. The first couple of videos we checked out were awesome. And I am an immediate fan of this whole video series. We're probably going to check out the whole thing on this channel. It's just a really good starting point for any of this information, for me at least, because a lot of this stuff I never got to in school or didn't really dive deep into it. And now we get to check it out in a really humorous kind of way, so it's awesome. Okay, so let's just dive into it. The French Revolution Oversimplified Part 2. And here we go. King Louis and his family were now in the Tuileries Palace in Paris, where for the next couple of years, he watched as the revolutionary government began to strip away his power. And fearing for his safety, he had to stay on their good side. Hey, look who it is. It's my favorite revolutionaries. Yep, I'm your number one fan. What can I do for you? Hey, King Louis, so we've made a few decisions. First, all of your friends in the nobility are going to have to pay taxes the same as everyone else. Great idea. I love it. And as a side note, the tax money can no longer pay for all your lavish parties. Great. I hate those parties. They're so awkward. And also, we're taking away your Porsche. Oh, come on! I mean... Yay. The king continually <laughs> found demand after demand being made of him to prove his support for the revolution. On one occasion, a mob would invade the palace and demand he wear the revolutionary bonnet. This is the face of a man who is definitely pretending he wants to wear that bonnet. Now around here, I want to mention that one thing King Louis had a problem with was people constantly raiding his palace. But one thing he didn't have a problem with was raiding noobs on this video's sponsor, Raid Shadow Legends. Ah, Raid Shadow well Legends done. is a brand new collection RPG game with amazing 3D graphics, an awesome storyline, and giant boss fights, all free to play on your phone. There's over 400 <laughs> champions for you to collect and customize and crazy battles and events that will get you hooked immediately. You can find me in the game under the nickname Oversimplified. And if you're quick enough and cool enough, you can join my clan. Go to the video description, click on the special links, and you will instantly get 50,000 silver. That's a and pretty a good way to incorporate an ad, actually. As part of the new player program to start your journey. Good luck, and I'll see you there. <laughs> now, where was I? Oh, yeah. Seeing the situation rapidly turning against him, the king decided it might be a good idea to leave France and mount a campaign to retake his country from abroad. Luckily for him, he was married to an Austrian. So on the night of June 20th, 1791, the king and his family disguised themselves as servants and attempted to flee to the Austrian Netherlands. The royal carriage made a stop in the town of Varennes, and the postmaster there was like, Hey guys, what's up? Where are you off to? We are but a collection of inconspicuous servants heading for the border for no particular reason at all. <laughs> Say, you, the fat one, you look kind of familiar. Aren't you the king? Nope. Let me see your passport. It says here you're King Louis the Sixteenth. Nope. Not me. Take him away, boys. The king was promptly returned to Paris, but now the jig was up. Not much His of a lack king of at that point. The revolution was clear to all and many considered him a straight-up traitor who tried to abandon his people. As a result, the new constitution of 1791 completely reduced his powers to that of a simple figurehead, a constitutional monarch. However, radicals, such as those in the Jacobin Club, were outraged that the king wasn't to be removed oh, entirely. They, they were so a month later, this. these radicals staged a protest on the Champ du Mars, calling for the king's removal. The government of Paris feared an insurrection was mounting, and they sent the military to disperse the crowd. The confrontation escalated and resulted in the Revolutionary National Guard firing on a crowd of revolutionaries. It was a massacre. The incident exposed a deep division within the Brotherhood of the Revolution. On one side, the moderates who wanted to keep the king as a figurehead. On the other, radicals who wanted to see the king deposed and heads roll. In the wake of the massacre, these radicals received a wave of support. And speaking of rolling heads, one form of equality the revolution so introduced terrible. was equality in execution. This meant no more torturous drawing and quartering, no more inhumane hanging. They wanted all criminals, regardless of economic status, to receive the same penalty, a quick and painless one. Luckily, a man by the name of Dr. Joseph Guillotine had an idea. A heavy blade that falls like thunder. The head flies off. 
blood spurts, and the man is no more. The guillotine, otherwise known as the National Razor. The guillotine made its debut in 1791 as the new form of execution. The writings of Marat and others continued to call for the execution of anyone suspected of working against the revolution. For him, this included some members of the clergy and nobility who had previously benefited from the cruel system of inequality that existed before the revolution. In many parts of the country, the crazy he really was. Had found They're really painting him like a, a nutcase. Sire, the peasants, they're revolting. Oh, come on, that's a bit harsh. Sure, they smell a bit, but I wouldn't say they're revolting. <laughs> oh, yes, I see what you mean. Increasingly, <laughs> these French aristocrats began fleeing France to find solitude in other parts of Europe. And once again, fear began to take hold. The privileged classes of these foreign nations didn't like what they were seeing because they feared revolutionary ideas may spread to their own lands. The National Assembly, actually now the Legislative Assembly, feared that these nations may decide to attack. Then why don't we attack them first? No, you idiots, we are definitely not ready for war yet. Did somebody say something? France declared war in Austria in April 1792 and immediately got pummeled. It also didn't help that Austria's ally, Prussia, joined in the fighting. The Prussian Duke of Brunswick posted a letter warning the revolutionaries that if anything happened to the king, he would burn Paris to the ground. The Duke's letter proved to be a massive success in inspiring the people of Paris to do the exact opposite of what he intended. They were enraged by the threat, and on the 10th of August 1792, the tension in the city exploded, and a mob stormed the king's palace. Fighting broke out between the revolutionaries and the king's Swiss guard, with casualties in the hundreds. King Louis fled and took refuge in the chamber of the Legislative Assembly, where Robespierre and his radical Jacobins were gaining ever more power. Given the developing situation, the chamber decided to hold a vote, and in what some considered to be a second revolution, it was decided to suspend the monarchy entirely. King Louis XVI was now just plain old Louis, and he was sent to a prison cell where an eye could be kept on him. A month later, the newly established National Convention officially declared the French Republic, and society underwent a massive change. Enlightened ideas of democracy and equality were being implemented, but very quickly, these ideas seemed to become secondary to fear, paranoia, and a thirst for blood. The new republic began working to violently remove any semblance of the old royalist regime. The church became a prime target. Priests who refused to take an oath to the revolution were deported or arrested. A new state-sponsored atheistic religion named the Cult of Reason was created as a replacement for the Catholic Church. Notre Dame, along with many other churches, had their religious treasures destroyed and were converted to temples of reason. Even the Christian calendar didn't survive, as a brand new revolutionary calendar was soon introduced. Hey honey, I'm home. Yeah, whatever, jerk. Whoa, what's wrong with you? You forgot. Forgot what? Everything! This entire year! My birthday was on the 3rd of Germinal, our anniversary was the 12th of Thermidor, <laughs> and you promised that in Freimer, we'd go on a romantic weekend trip to Venice. No, I said we'd do that in December. December hasn't been a thing for years! The government of Paris, now under the control of the radical Saint-Culotte, began rounding up suspected enemies of the revolution and sending them to prison in the thousands. Naturally, a large number of those arrested were members of the clergy and aristocracy. As France's foreign enemies continued to close in, panic spread. Georges Danton made impassioned calls for men to defend the Republic, and tens of thousands of troops left Paris for the front lines. However, in their absence, Paris was left to its own devices. As enemy troops arrived in Verdun, the people of Paris feared that their crowded prisons were becoming a breeding ground for counter-revolutionary conspiracy. What would happen if the Prussians reached Paris and freed the aristocrats? Marat believed he knew what would happen. The aristocrats would enact their vengeance on the people. Fearing those they had already imprisoned, mobs descended on Paris's prisons. They broke in, and during the brutal September massacres, aristocrats, priests, and others were tried and executed on the spot. Even women and children weren't spared. With over 1,600 victims, word of the massacre spread across Europe. One British newspaper wondered, are these the rights of man? Is this the liberty of human nature? But there was still one man in particular that Robespierre and his radicals really wanted to see executed. Austria and Prussia pledged that after they defeated France, they'd return King Louis to the throne. Well, checkmate Austria and Prussia, because you can't return a man to the throne if he's already dead. Citizen Louis Capet was put on trial for treason. Obviously, he was found guilty, but his punishment was less certain. Many moderates wanted to simply deport him, but Robespierre insisted the revolution could only live if the king was dead. A vote was held, and by just one vote, Louis was sentenced to the guillotine. If you don't mind, I'd like to say a few words first. Gentlemen, 
I am innocent of everything of which I am acute. Wait, you're too loud. They can't hear me. Hang on, I haven't finished yet. Wait, dude! Dang. Uncool. In her prison cell, Marie Antoinette heard the guns fire, signaling her husband's death. Before long, she would meet the same fate. Back on the war front, France defied all expectations and actually managed to push the enemy back. But then more countries joined the coalition against France and it all went to pot again. What do we do? Conscript the masses. The National Convention introduced a conscription law, with each regional department having to meet a certain quota of men for the army. However, not everyone was happy with this new law. You see, while Paris was definitely a hotbed for radical revolutionary fervor, some of the regions outside of Paris weren't quite so keen on the revolution. Some were largely still conservative, still supported the church, and just didn't suffer from that much inequality before the revolution. So as the revolution turned increasingly violent and anti-Christian, many were outraged. Now, they were being conscripted to fight for the new republic they hated. That was the last straw. Counter-revolutionary uprisings erupted in a number of regions across France. Some would last for years, such as in the Northwest, where a large-scale uprising was led by the Owls. Why were they called the Owls? Because their leader was named Jean Owl. Why was he called Jean Owl? Possibly because he could do a really good impression of an owl. Really? That's what we're going with? Owls? Just because this guy can do an impression of one? Hit him with it, Jean. Hoot hoot. Yeah, okay, that's pretty good. The Shrinery <laughs> Uprising lasted all the way until 1800. In the summer of 1793, the southern city of Toulon invited the British Navy over for some tea and crumpets, and then they asked if they'd possibly like to stay and occupy the city. Being an important naval base, this was a heavy blow to the Republic, who sent a relatively unknown young captain by the name of Napoleon Bonaparte to help stage the siege of the city. Toulon was recaptured by France in the winter, and for his service, Napoleon was promoted to the rank of Brigadier General. The most infamous counter-revolution, however, occurred in the Vendée region. Throughout 1793, revolutionary forces clashed with the region's Catholic and Royal Army. The Republic defeated the counter-revolution through cruel pacification. In particular, General Jean-Baptiste Carrier committed brutal atrocities. In one instance, he had thousands of civilians, priests, women and children tied to ships, which were then sunk. Carrier would later be found guilty of war crimes and executed. Back in Paris, the government was still dominated by moderates. With the war going badly, revolts in the provinces, and the economy getting worse, it seemed the government just wasn't doing a very good job. Radicals' fear for the safety of the revolution intensified, and Marat even began calling for the moderates in the government to be executed. In return, the moderates called for the arrest of Marat. This led to a chain of events with the two sides in heated conflict. Robespierre declared the Jacobins to be an insurrection and called on the people to arm themselves. It all ended on the 31st of May 1793 with the National Convention surrounded by radical saint culottes and 29 moderate Girondin politicians arrested. From this moment on, the moderates ceased to be a political force. Robespierre and his radicals would be in almost total control of the government. And this brings us to the story of a woman named Charlotte Corday. Charlotte lived in the northwest city of Caen, and like many in the area, was horrified at the rapid radicalization and increasing violence of the revolution. And the man she blamed more than anyone was Jean-Paul Marat. She wanted to bring peace wrong. back to France, and so she did something drastic. She traveled to Paris and told Marat she had a list of enemies for him to publish in his paper. Marat eagerly invited her in for a meeting. So where's that list of enemies you promised me? Here it is. Wait a minute. This isn't a list of enemies. It just says Yippie Kaye, mother. <laughs> and just like Jeez. that, Marat was no more. Charlotte was quickly arrested and sent to the guillotine. Her dream of restoring peace, however, died with her. Marat became a martyr. In Temples of Reason, symbols of the dead Marat became the new crucifix. In death, he became an even more powerful inspiration for the extreme levels of violence that were about to rip throughout the new republic. And that's right. Here comes the reign of terror. If you thought this revolution already sounds pretty violent, well, you ain't seen nothing yet, son. The radicals were now in control, and they believed not only was France surrounded by foreign enemies, but that within the masses, there were also plenty of internal ones too. Individuals not loyal to the revolution, conspiring to bring about its downfall. 
Robespierre and the rest of the radical faction were having none of it. A new committee of public safety was established with 12 members. Its purpose was to protect the new French Republic from its enemies, and it basically became a 12-man dictatorship with Robespierre as its leading voice. The Revolutionary Tribunal was also reinstated. A special court created to streamline the process of trying suspected enemies and handing out their death sentences. With these two new institutions, Robespierre wanted to scare France's enemies straight. In September 1793, it was announced that terror would be the order of the day. In other words, fear had become official government policy. And from then onwards, we enter into the period known as the Reign of Terror. Spies and secret police were everywhere and watched the people closely. France's public had to be extremely careful what they said and how they behaved. Obviously, criticizing this new system or the government would quickly have you sent off to the guillotine. But that's not all. Even the most minor offense could have you tried before the Revolutionary Tribunal. Hello, Citizen Martin. Hello, Monsieur Dubois. Monsieur? Did I just hear you say Monsieur? That's the old style of address, my friend. To the guillotine! You know what? I didn't like him, but I do feel kind of bad for the king and his family. Oof, expressing sympathy for the royal family, are we? To the guillotine! 12 sous for a loaf of bread? That's way overpriced. To the guillotine! Man, this bread line is taking forever. To the guillotine! And you, you look like you're thinking anti-revolutionary thoughts. To the guillotine. Max, we're sending way too many people to the guillotine. To the guillotine! Chop, 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 chop. It was insane. All across France, about 40,000 people were killed for suspected crimes against liberty. Oh my Let's say your goodness. neighbor won't stop mowing the lawn at 7 in the morning. Well, then all you gotta do is tell the government they've been talking smack about the revolution. And there's a good chance they'll end up in front of the revolutionary tribunal. Maybe they'll even be executed, taking a metaphorical load off your shoulders and a literal one off theirs. The most prominent victim of the reign of terror was a certain Marie Antoinette, who was finally tried and found guilty of treason in 1793. I can't even she laugh at her hairstyle right now. She brought to the guillotine in a royal carriage, fit for a queen. All the republic could provide for her, however, was a wooden tumbrel. At 37 years old, the most hated woman in French history met her end on the 16th of October, 1793. Robespierre had saved the revolution through terror. Internal dissent was being suppressed. The food situation was no longer quite as bad. Even the French military had got its act together again and pummeled the Allies at the Battle of Fleurus. For Danton and his followers, the time was right to try to normalize the French Republic. Hey, Robespierre, so we were thinking that since things are finally going better, maybe we should rein in the terror. And while we're on it, we could possibly start taking it easier on the church and also try to end this costly war. Hmm. Oh. Crap. As time went on, Robespierre seemed to go, for lack of a better term, a bit mental. He was hell-bent on creating what he called a republic of virtue, and for him, this meant amping up the bloodshed even more. Throughout the spring and summer of 1794, executions head. reached an unprecedented level during a period known as the Great I know what everybody else is too. closest to him found their way to the guillotine if they dared oppose his ideas and actions, and he began alienating himself from the rest of the convention. He created a new deistic religion called the Cult of the Supreme Being, along with the new annual Festival of the Supreme Being. Man, I think Robespierre is really starting to lose it. He thinks he's a god or something. Nonsense. Sure, he's gone a little extreme, but he doesn't think he's a god. My children, bathe your immortal souls in the virtue of my republic. Okay, yeah, he's completely lost it. Robespierre's ultimate mistake, however, came on July 26th, when he made a speech to the National Convention, in which he said this, I have in my hand a brand new list of enemies to be sent to the guillotine, and many of you are on this list, but I'm not gonna tell you who yet. What do you think of that? I think we should send Robespierre to the guillotine first. All in favor? So that no, no. Two days later, Robespierre became the final victim of the monstrous terror and paranoia he had created. Many historical accounts of the revolution end here with the death of Robespierre and his terror. But the revolution officially continued for another five years until 1799. So what happened between now and then? Well, after the fall of Robespierre, a more moderate political group called the Thermidorians took control of the convention. They wanted to restore stability to the government. Now, Robespierre's allies and other radicals who had fueled the terror themselves became the target of political suppression. Bourgeois street fighters took on the radical saint culottes in the streets during a period named the White Terror. In 1795, the Thermidorians drafted a new constitution and created a government called the Directory with the purpose of preventing power from being able to fall into the hands of a single individual again. 
As this new government was being established, royalists who wanted to bring the monarchy back to France saw this moment as an opportunity to strike. They staged an insurrection in Paris and battled with the National Guard in the streets. Luckily, one Napoleon Bonaparte happened to be in Paris at the time, and he took control of the situation, firing on the crowd and putting down the insurrection. From this moment on, the people of Paris would never again and be able to stage a popular uprising and lost their control over the revolution. For his actions, Napoleon became a general and was sent to take control of the French armies in Italy. The new directory remained a fairly ineffective government for the remainder of the revolution. It was plagued with corruption and struggled to keep the economy afloat, and as a result, wasn't very popular. For the people of France, with the strict social customs of both royalist France and the tarragon, they didn't really know what to do with themselves. Men no longer removed their hats when talking to women, different classes began intermingling, and a publication began circulating that looked a lot like a modern dating app. It was social anarchy. Outside of France, the war continued. In 1795, France took the Netherlands, where they set up a puppet state. Then they negotiated both Prussia and Spain out of the war. The British attempted to land French royalists in the west to reinforce rebellion, but that plan failed. In 1796, the French planned a three-pronged attack with the aim of marching on Vienna and knocking Austria out of the war. The two northern armies were defeated and forced to retreat. However, Napoleon in the south, with groundbreaking military strategy, won battle after battle after battle. He pushed the Austrians out of Italy and began closing in on Vienna. The Austrians freaked out and Napoleon oversaw the signing of a peace treaty. He had almost single-handedly knocked Austria out of the war. And by the way, he was only 28. So maybe it's about time you moved out of your mom's basement. Napoleon became a famed <laughs> hero among the French people, but his aspirations were still higher. He briefly went off to Egypt and discovered a bunch of gnarly Egyptian stuff, but then the British destroyed his fleet and trapped his forces. Say, Napoleon, sir, you're not going to leave us here stuck in Egypt and return to France, are you? Nonsense, my boy. I would never dream of abandoning my loyal soldiers. Wow, what's that over there? On his return to Paris, Napoleon found himself to be extremely popular and the government extremely unpopular, and he started getting some power-hungry ideas. Conveniently, a politician named Emmanuel Joseph Sieyès approached Napoleon and said, Hey man, since you're so popular, do you want to help me stage a coup? Great idea. Let's stage a coup, and then I'll coup you. It's like what? it's never Napoleon, ending. Napoleon, with the help of his politician brother, entered the government chamber, possibly got punched in the face, and finally his troops intimidated the council to dissolve the government and create a new constitution that basically made Napoleon a dictator. So there you have it, the French Revolution, born with the great promise of liberty and equality. The common people dared challenge an oppressive system that had existed for centuries. But before they knew it, they found liberty sidelined by terror, equality that possibly didn't quite hit the mark, and an absolute monarchy replaced by an absolute dictator. Napoleon began stabilizing French society, he restored the Catholic Church and got rid of that crazy calendar, among other things. But he remained ever ambitious. He was France's first consul, but he slept soundly at night dreaming of being something even bigger. Napoleon's expansionist aspirations, combined with the ongoing conflict in Europe, would eventually lead the continent into a huge conflict known today as That's a lot to take in. I'm honestly a little stunned here. I really had no knowledge of everything that just happened in these two videos, part one and part two. I knew some of the names, but I hadn't really ever dug into the history on anything that just happened there. And that's crazy. In a big way, it really makes me appreciate how things shook out in the American Revolution as compared to this. It's like it was never ending chaos there for a while. I mean, a revolution going on for 10 years. But again, I have to say, you know, all credit to Oversimplified for really laying stuff out like this. I'm probably going to watch these videos through a couple of different times, especially in the areas where I really hadn't had any exposure to it. And that's what these things are great for. They're great for that first introduction, big picture, small details, well, small on details, you know, that 30,000 foot view of the information to give you a running start on all the material. And I'm definitely gonna run through not only this video a couple more times, obviously not on the channel, but all the rest of the videos as well. And those will be coming out from time to time. So definitely hit that subscribe and notify button so you don't miss out on those. If you have ideas for other videos that we should check out, leave those as comments on the video. And it doesn't have to be just stuff like this. If you have ideas for comedy videos or anything else, leave those in the comments down below. Other than that, keep an eye out for more videos coming up. And thanks so much for watching.